right, good afternoon. Welcome to our Sunday school here. Also to our online viewers. We are in lesson number 10. This has the title, The Progress of the Gospel. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 10. And um, before we start our lesson, let's go to our Sunday devotional. These are also some verses related to our lesson today. And they're found in the book of James, chapter 2. In the New Testament, James, chapter 2. This is the Sunday devotional in our lesson. James, chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. We see here an uh, important principle in the Bible that God is not prejudiced. God is not prejudiced. It means that God does not have any favoritism. It means that he does not show partiality. It means that all of his children are equally loved and equally accepted by him. And so we should also have this mind, the mind of Christ. And let's look here in James chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. James, he gives um, the instructions here to the Christians. James chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. <clears throat> James writes, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. In other words, don't have any favoritism or show partiality. For if there come unto you, or unto your assembly, it means to your fellowship, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. So there's two persons here, one with a nice clothing, and the one with, should we say, dirty clothing. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, it means the special and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So in other words, if someone comes to our fellowship, or to you as a Christian, and one of them is has a nice clothing and the other one does not have a nice clothing. Or we could say maybe a um, civilized person who comes and also maybe a homeless person or a social outcast. So there's a, a difference there in the outward appearance. So if we show them partiality, partiality or favoritism and treat the one with the nice clothing better than the other, well, then we are wrong. So here's the instruction in verse 5. Hearken, it means listen, my beloved brethren. Had not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law, note that the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, it means respect doesn't mean that we should not, not show respect. It just means that we should not be partial or show favoritism. Ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So what we learn here from James is that we should not be partial. We should not show favoritism or treat others better than other groups of people but we should fulfill the royal law which is to love your neighbor as yourself 
So we always have to put ourselves in their shoes, thinking, what if I was homeless or remember where we came from when we came from darkness into light. And in this way, we show the heart of God toward those who are lost. All right, so that is our Sunday devotional. God is not prejudiced. It also says in the King James, God is not a respecter of persons. It means he doesn't show favoritism. All right, so we are in lesson number 10, the progress of the gospel. We've been studying the book of Acts for several weeks now. And uh, we are in Acts chapter 10. And the key verse today is verse number 43. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. And it says, To him, that is to Jesus, give all the prophets witness, that is the prophets in the Old Testament, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fellowship that we can enjoy today as brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the truth that has been revealed to us through your son, Jesus. He is the truth. He is the way and he is the life. And no one comes to you except through him. Father, as we look upon your word today, as we read it, as we study it, we pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us what you want us to know, Lord, that we may grasp a greater glimpse of the wonderful work that Jesus did on the cross, because what Jesus did on the cross reflects your heart. It reflects who you are, a holy and righteous God who loved us so much that he chose to take all our sins and put it on his own beloved son. And as Jesus, your son, consumed your wrath and all our sins upon himself, he drank the cup of your righteous and holy wrath upon sin. And he consumed it and he died. But we thank you that he rose again for our justification. And through his name, we receive the forgiveness of sins. Not as in the Old Testament, that the blood of bulls and goats could only cover it. But Jesus' blood has paid it once and for all. And so we rejoice in him because we are saved and we are forgiven. We exalt you, Lord Jesus, and we pray that you would lead us into your truth and that we may know you more and be an ambassador of Christ in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in Acts chapter 10. Now, a first look at our lesson today. God has clearly revealed the direction he wanted his churches to take. Now, his instruction to the church in Jerusalem was very simple. Here was the instruction they were to preach, to proclaim the good news in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost part, parts of the earth. Now, if we apply this to ourselves today, we have our own Jerusalem. Your Jerusalem is your city or your town that you live in. That is where you are raised. Your Judea is the surrounding area. It could be Copenhagen or Schiller, or maybe in your country, you know which part. And then Samaria. Samaria is the place where the Jews did not want to go because they did not want to have fellowship with Samaritans. So maybe when we become Christians, we also have some Samaritans, so to say, in our lives. Some people that we would not talk with 
before we became Christians. Maybe we also had some prejudices. And then the gospel is to continue to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we are privileged, we are blessed that we have the Facebook Live, we have the YouTube, the internet, whereby we can share the gospel through these channels. Now, when we understand this command in light of other verses, such as Mark 16, 15 to 20, and Matthew 28, 18 to 20, these are the great commission, we can easily see that the mission of churches is a worldwide endeavor, a worldwide endeavor. However, many of the early disciples were Jews. So remember, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came to the Jews, but also to the Greeks and to the Gentiles. But many of the early Christians were Jews. So it would have been easy to conclude that Christianity was going to be a Jewish movement and that the Gentiles would play a minor role in it. Now, the truth is that Jesus, he died for all men everywhere and the ministry of his churches likewise is to all men everywhere. And for this to happen, some prejudices had to be overcome. So we are going to see in this story how the apostle Peter, who was a Jew, he was uh, also called to share the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And uh, we are going to see how the struggle uh, Peter encountered, because it was not easy for him to overcome the tradition that he had followed for several years not to have fellowship with the Gentiles, which is the non-Jews. But nevertheless, God has a plan, and he still has today, that the gospel is to be shared to everyone. It doesn't matter what race, what skin color, what background, what religion they have, the gospel is for everyone. So, the overt demonstration of the Holy Spirit, the overt means it was shown openly. We're going to see this in the verses. Recorded in the lesson today should teach us that the gospel is for all. The lesson today centers on two men that God used in this wonderful event. Now the first one is a Roman centurion. A centurion is a Roman uh, commander. Usually he has 100 soldiers or more under his uh, leadership. And his name is Cornelius. And also God, he prepared the apostle Peter. So we're going to see what we call a, a divine appointment. God is preparing Cornelius. He was not yet a Christian. And God is also preparing the apostle Peter for something specific. Now, for centuries, the law of the Hebrews was very clear. Here's the law. The Jews were not to keep company with people from other nations. Now, let's look here in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. It's very clear here. In Acts chapter 10, verse 28, it says here, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, it means to fellowship, or come unto one of another nation. But God had shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So you see here, it's a Jew, it's a Jewish law that they were not to keep fellowship with non-Jews. Can you imagine that? If you were a Jew, you could only eat with Jews. You could only fellowship with Jews. Probably your business relationships, your schools, everything is centered around the Jewish community. So that's what Peter had followed for centuries. Now, the Jewish worldview was simple in that anyone who was not a Jew was a Gentile. Sometimes you hear the question, what is a Gentile? 
well, basically a Gentile is a non-Jew. So all of, us, all of us in here are Gentiles. I don't believe we have any Jews here. No? Oh, may, oh, Brother Manny, okay. Interesting. You can share your story later on. <laughs> Remember also the Jewish line goes through the mother, the mother. So if your grandfather was a Jew, well, you're not a Jew, but if your grandmother is a Jew, then you would be considered a Jew. All right, so a Gentile was a foreigner, and Peter broke with a long tradition when he went to minister and to have fellowship with Cornelius. Now let's jump a bit forward here in Acts 11, because we're going to see how Peter's fellow Jews who had become Christians reacted to what Peter did. In Acts 11, verse 2 and 3, Acts chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, it says, And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, remember that's under the law, contended with him. It means that they were discussing with Peter. There was an argument saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. Okay? So there was a contention, there was a discussion between Peter and his fellow Jews who had become Christians. Why? Because Peter had gone to the Gentiles and he had even eaten, eaten with them had fellowship with them. So what Peter is about to do in this story shows that the Jews were offended by Peter's actions. They were offended. So what can we learn here also is that sometimes doing God's will will offend some people. It could even offend your brother or sister in Christ. Remember the Bible says that open rebuke is better than secret love. Sometimes we have to share the truth, but always in love. But sometimes people will be offended even when they hear the truth, even when you speak it in love. Now, we need to remember also that it's never wrong to do right. It's never wrong to do right. If God has revealed it in the scriptures, we should do it. But always in the spirit of love. That is very important. Because obviously, the motivation for Peter to do this was that God had revealed to Peter that he was to go to the Gentiles because God wanted to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. So the lesson here is that more important matters are at stake than our individual prejudices. In Danish, the word prejudice is fordom. In fordom. A prejudice is a pre-opinion that you have of a person or a group. For example, you may have a prejudice about Muslims. Because maybe you've only heard about Muslims in the news. Maybe every time you hear about the Muslims, it's only about war. But did you know that there are also very peaceful Muslims? Did you know that Muslims, they also enjoy to eat together and have fellowship? There are also peaceful Muslims. So the point here is that we should not have prejudices because it can hinder the work of God that he wants us to share the gospel to everyone. So, the work of God requires that we follow the plan of God, whether we like it or not. Now, I believe that when we follow the plan of God, there's going to be blessings of joy, blessings of peace. It says here, whether we like it or not. Well, at some point, we might not like it because it has to do with our comfort zone. Sometimes God wants us to do something that we don't feel comfortable with. 
But nevertheless, if it is God's plan, we should do it. And we should yield and submit to it. And when we do it, we'll also experience the blessings. Now God, he had a wonderful future plan for the Gentile churches. He had already called Saul, later named Paul, to the work of establishing Gentile churches. And now it was necessary for others to understand this part of the great work of taking the gospel to the whole world. So that is the plan of God here in this story. Now let's have a closer look. Let's see here the man who was a God-fearing Gentile. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 2, the Bible says here regarding Cornelius. Acts 10 there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion or captain of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So as Paul would later preach, God has set the bounds of all nations and has revealed himself in his own way to all men. Now let's see something, something interesting here in Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 26 to 27. Acts chapter 17. Because remember, Cornelius, he was not yet a Christian, but he was worshiping God through giving alms, helping the poor, and praying. So in Acts 17, verse 26 to 27, it says here, And had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So what it means here that God had made all of one blood, all nations of men. What it means here is that we all come from the same ancestor, which is Adam and Eve. We all come from the same bloodline. And God has also determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God, he knew the different nations that would rise and that would fall before it happened. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So it says here that God, he knows all human beings. We all come from the same bloodline. He knows the different nations. But it says here that, that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him. The word feel after him is also as one walking in darkness, trying to uh, feel your way through. Have you ever tried that? You get up in the night, you go into the bathroom, you don't turn on the lights, and you go back to the bedroom and you try to, you know, navigate through the darkness, try not to stumble over something. In the same way it is, there are some people who have not yet heard the gospel but they're feeling, they're looking after God, the true God. I know someone who has been through the different religions in the world, like Buddhism, spiritualism, New Age, different kind of religions. Eventually, he found the truth, which is Jesus. And the same we're going to see here with Cornelius, Cornelius was seeking God, but he had not yet found Jesus. So what does it mean here? It means that God is near. God he is near. And God, he wants to reveal himself to those who want to know him. Because it says here in Acts 17, 27, If happily they might feel after him and find him, Though he be not far from every one of us. So you see, God is very near. I remember before I became a Christian, I felt that God, the limited knowledge that I had of God 
was that, that I could feel in my heart that he was drawing me, but I didn't know the truth. So I remember one night I prayed as I looked up into the night sky, to the moon. I just prayed, God, if you're out there, please reveal yourself to me. And he did. You see, God is not a God who wants to hide from us. He's a God who wants to reveal himself to us. And he did reveal himself to us in the most historic event in history, which was when Jesus came to earth. Have you ever thought about the fact that we name our timeline after the birth of Jesus? So Jesus, God is near and he will reveal himself if we seek him. So this kind of revelation had taken place in the heart of a Roman soldier named Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion, meaning he was in charge of at least 100 soldiers, and his command was called the Italian Band. Evidently, Cornelius was a good soldier, and he had risen through the ranks because of his valor. Now, valor means that he had courage in face of danger. Obviously, if you're a commander, a commander in charge, you need to have certain, a certain amount of courage. At this time, the Italian band was stationed, stationed in Caesarea, a Roman settlement on the Mediterranean Sea in northern Samaria. Cornelius was a devout man. It says in the scripture, a devout means that he was committed which means that he showed proper respect and reverence to others in his life, especially toward God. He feared God, which means that he had rejected the silliness of the Roman idolatry and knew that there was only one true God. Also, St. Cornelius, he had instilled this knowledge in his household. And his beliefs found expression in his generosity to those less fortunate. It's interesting to know the story that Cornelius, he was giving money to the poor. He was giving food and clothing to the poor and was praying to God. But he hadn't yet found Jesus. But God saw his heart. Now, in addition to this, he prayed to God always. This suggests that within the limits of his knowledge and experience, Cornelius was doing all that he could to serve and worship the Lord. His heart was like the good ground described in Matthew 13. Now, I want us to look in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to have this lesson over two sessions, but let's go to Matthew 13. This is the parable that Jesus speaks regarding the heart, how there are different hearts, different soils. In Matthew 13, verse 1, it says here, the same day, when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold a sow sower went forth to sow and when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. 
but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who had ears to hear, let him hear. Now you've probably heard this parable before, but these different kind of sorrows represents the heart. Now obviously, the last sorrow, the good ground, is the heart that was ready to receive the word. It was the heart that was humble and teachable. It was the person with the listening heart. As King Solomon had a request, he could just ask anything of God, and he asked God for a listening heart. He asked God for wisdom. So Cornelius, he had this good ground, this good soil, this heart that was teachable, this heart that was open. And this is where the truth could take root and bring forth an abundant increase. The point here is that God responds to our faith wherever that faith is found. When we believe what truth we have, we will be led to more truth. The light may at first be dim, but it will lead to more light and eventually the great light of God's word. We also see that God rewards faithful service with more opportunities to serve him. It is important to learn that no one person or group has an exclusive right to truth. The sun will shine on anyone wise enough to get outdoors. The light of God's truth was never confined to a nation or a race of people. Whenever people will honestly consider the evidence before them and honestly endeavor to follow the truth they know, they will be led to truth that will eventually bring them to Jesus Christ who is the bodily fullness of all things. So Cornelius, he had a open, a humble heart, and God revealed himself to him. Now, I just want to show you here in Ephesians regarding the Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. It says here, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remember, Jesus is the truth. He is truth revealed. We may have all the doctrines right, but if we fail to be like Christ, we fail. We could follow all the right rules. But if people cannot see Christ in us, it is just in vain. We can always look to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And that is truly God's plan for us. Remember the verse that says that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. But what is the good? What is the purpose? The next verse says that we may be conformed to the image of his son. All things happen for a reason, for good. Even the bad things happen for good. Why? What good can we have out of trials and testings and hardships and people who are difficult to love? Conformity to Christ. Because if people were perfect, how would we ever learn to show grace and mercy? How would we ever learn the heart of Christ? Everything happens so that we may be more like Christ. Now, we need to wrap this up. Um, let's go here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Just one book forward from Ephesians. 
It says here, For it pleased the Father that in him, that is Jesus, should all fullness dwell. And Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in him, that is Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So whenever we look to Jesus, he's our great shepherd. He's our great example. As the great apostle Paul said, as I follow Christ, so follow me. Always look to Christ. Whenever you do as Christ did, you would never be wrong. You could never go wrong in following his example. Now, we just have five more minutes. We'll cover some of the second part. Uh, God works from both sides. We've seen a short uh, overview of Cornelius. Now, in Acts chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, this is about Cornelius. Remember, God revealed himself. In Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, verse 3, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, that is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Memorial means record. God had seen it. God had heard it. And now sent men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And then verse 11. Now this is jumping over to Peter. Because Peter, he was also on his rooftop praying around the 12th hour, which would be, uh, um, or sorry, the 6th hour, which would be in the uh, noon, around 12 o'clock. And uh, we also learned that Peter, he was fasting, he was hungry, so probably he had skipped his morning breakfast and he was praying. You know, sometimes we can also just fast and pray by skipping a morning breakfast, like Saturdays. It's a good day to do it if you don't have work. And uh, God is saying something to Peter in verse 11. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice also to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So again, we see here God is making a divine appointment. He is preparing Cornelius, who did not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ. And also he's preparing Peter, who was a Christian. And he's preparing them to meet together. The Gentile, the non-Jew, and the Jew, Peter. And the whole point is to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. If it had not happened, we would not be here today, because we are also Gentiles. So one day while Cornelius was praying, at about the ninth hour of the day, he saw this vision. And in his vision, an angel came to him, and in true military fashion, gave him orders to carry out. Note carefully the response of Cornelius. It is similar to that of Saul on the road to Damascus. Also note the contrast between the response of this devout Roman and the response recorded later from Peter. It's funny to see that Peter, he actually said, not so, Lord. He denied God's voice. Cornelius asked the angel what he wanted, and the angel replied that God had been aware of Cornelius' search for the truth and his willingness to obey the truth he knew. And now it was time for this devout Roman to be introduced to Jesus. Cornelius was instructed to send men to Joppa, 
Joppa, about 30 miles to the south, and looked for Simon Peter, who was temporarily living in another man's house, whose name was Simon, who was a tanner. Then Simon Peter would come and tell Cornelius what he was to do. When we are honestly seeking the will of God, we will find it. The method taught here is that we should do the best we can with whatever resources we have and then trust God to show us what we are to do in the future. Now today, God reveals his will through his word and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now we don't have much more time, but I just want to leave you with this principle from the Bible. God has given to us the scriptures. God has given to us the Holy Spirit. Now whenever we seek God's will, there will always be unity between the Bible and the Holy Spirit within your heart. And this, this is very important because if you only depend the leadership of God upon how you feel, but it contradicts the scriptures, it is not from God. Because who wrote the scriptures? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Jesus said, I will not leave you but I will send the comforter. He will teach you. He will guide you. He will remind you of the truths. So whenever we seek God's will as Christians, obviously we should pray and wait for the Lord to lead us with his peace. The Bible says that we should let the peace of God rule within our hearts. So whenever God's peace is not there, it means that you should wait. Don't go ahead of God. If you want to be led by God, then let the peace of God rule within your heart. And then seek what the scriptures say in regards to this matter. I have tried again and again to have great business opportunities. Everything looked great, but I didn't have peace. The peace of God that surpasses my own understanding. And so I had to wait upon the Lord, and eventually, as I trusted him, on the other side came something that was even better than what I could ever imagine or even think. So God, he knows the future. We can rest in his wisdom. Remember, he's the Alpha and Omega. He is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's the beginning and the end. So we'll end with that, and next time we'll continue our lesson with Cornelius and Peter, and we'll see how God put them together to bring salvation to the house of Cornelius. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for being such a wonderful and wise and gracious God and for revealing yourself to us through your son and giving us your holy word. As David said, thy word is a light to my path, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So thank you, Father, that we can rest in you, especially when we are in Jesus, we can rest in you because the work is finished. And Lord, help us, Father, to not live this Christian life in our own strength, in our own intellect, but to be led by your spirit, to be led by your truth, and to walk step by step in faith. Lord, faith is what pleases you. Cornelius had faith to send for Peter. And you told him that I will show you, Cornelius, what to do next. But you just have to obey now. And even Peter, he was told to go to follow these people that came to his home. But he did not know what was about to happen. So, Father, help us to rest in you and to follow your guidance 
not to be stressful, not to be anxious, but to rest and to let your peace rule within our hearts and to take the step of faith as you allow us, as you guide us. And as we do that, we'll be walking in the center of your will and we will see your power and your glory because you are alive. You are the one and true and living God. I pray, Father, that you bless our worship service today. May we tune in our hearts upon you, upon Jesus, and may you knit our hearts together in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.